Dennis, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, what are we going to pick up on our story of uh, the power elite, their hope and their future, and where will we be going today? Uh, well, the, the uh, subtitle is actually Their History and Their Future. Their History and Their Future. Yeah. Go right I ahead. Look uh, to the back and then uh, forward. And, uh, we'll pick up where we left off last time, and that's with their historical outline. And in that particular chapter, I divided it into two parts, uh, midway. Uh, you will see that I, at first, had given a sort of chronological history, uh, uh, outline of uh, what they are doing in economics, and politics, and so forth. But then very soon, and in the middle of the chapter, I pick up on values, and there's a specific reason for that. But uh, what I, where we left off last time was, uh, was that uh, rather famous quote of David Rockefeller, Admitting in his book memoirs, 2002, that he had been part of a is part of a secret cabal, which is uh, quote conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated political and economic structure, one world, if you will. Now, uh, the, the 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 cabal, of course, is secret, and uh, that means uh, its members are not all known. And uh, what what you might uh, like to do is sort of search that uh, a little further and see who who might be involved. There are specific names that could be mentioned, but there there are, of course, because it's secret uh, individuals who who are not known. And at the beginning, to give an example of that, at the beginning of the prologue in Nicholas Hager's a book called The Syndicate, and the subtitle is The Story of the Coming World Government. Uh, that was published about nine years ago. In there, he reveals uh, that the Queen of England is alleged to have told uh, her butler, whose name was Paul Burrell, B-U-R-R-E-L-L, a few months after Princess Diana, Diana's death in the car crash, which occurred uh, back in August of 97, uh, she is supposed to have said to him, quote, be careful, there are powers at work in this country, that's England, about which we have no knowledge, end quote. So here you have uh, even the Queen of England acknowledging that there are these powers, and even she doesn't know who they are, which uh, the people who are at work. So it's not that uh, all of these people are known, like David Rockefeller, some are uh, unknown even to the Queen of England. And I'm sure this is really very, very true. Um, basically, these people work within the shadows, but they're bound together by powerful spiritual forces. And this is what most people don't understand. They think this is all a desire for power, and much of it is. But behind them are dark and sinister spiritual forces that are directing the course of the people who rule the world today. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and our guest uh, this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we're going to be talking about his book, uh, The Power Elite, Their History, and Their Future. And we're basically going through this over a period of weeks as we go through his, the background of his book. And basically, you need to get the book it's available to our ministry by calling one 800 Five four four eight nine two seven. But Dr. Cuddy was simply uh, talking about uh, David Rockefeller in his book Memoirs. Actually, talked about the fact that, and he mentions on page four hundred and five that he's part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, conspiring with others throughout the world to bring about this more global and integrated society. And that's the charge. He's proud of it. He's proud of it. He's part of it. And basically, of course, this is his quotation. And then. Chris Dennis was simply referring to the fact that there's a book written about nine years ago in which the Queen of England is quoted as having told her butler, and because uh, the butler writes a book, and he tell, he says that the Queen of England, shortly after Princess Diana's death, says there are forces so powerful here in this country that even we don't know who they are. Uh, and inferring that there are these powerful forces ruling England. And it's really quite true. They rule England. They rule the United States. And the average individual really doesn't understand. He sees all the contradictions. And he sort of throws up his uh, his hands. It's just 
doesn't make sense. And as we pointed out, why are we fighting uh, Al Qaeda and the certainly the Muslim Brotherhood in Afghanistan, and, and we're funding and financing Al Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria and, and in Libya and in Egypt and in Tunisia? Why are we doing that? Why do we? Uh, it's been fighting in Afghanistan since the year 2003. Uh, and now we're funding the same people we're fighting. Doesn't make sense. You're not supposed to ask the questions. Dr. Kelly, you go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the reason I'm mentioning Rockefeller talking about a secret cabal as opposed to just a cabal or a group is that while some people, such as himself, are very well known, there's two are uh, secret. And I was just giving one example of how the Queen of England is mentioning there are powers at work in this country, she said, about which we have no knowledge. Now, as I uh, had mentioned before, the, the power elite uses a strategy of a dialectical process. And so to get to this, uh, as Rockefeller said, more integrated political and economic structure, uh, the, the strategy is to go through regionalization. Uh, in order to achieve this world socialist government, they are, hold that th- hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back with all of our stations in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is simply pointing out that to to accomplish their goal, are these people within the secret cabal? He's part of it. Now, remember, there's not just one secret cabal in the world. I think there are a number of secret cabals out there, uh, many times vying with one another for power. But, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Cuddy says that uh, at least the one that is operating out of America controls our government, controls both political parties and make mock of the electoral process. Basically, of course, they're working through regionalization. They're certainly working with the, their counterparts in Europe to regionalize America, the North American Union, to regionalize Europe, certainly the European Union, and then he tries to uh, eventually hope to do the same thing in nations throughout the world, and then when they have all the regions organized, to unite them together into this one authoritarian, brutal, tyrannical world structure. But, of course, we're told, oh, this is democracy. That's what we're bringing democracy to the world. We'll go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the idea is you have this uh, European Union. You also have a sort of relatively new African Union, and then you have uh, uh, <laughs> an arrangement to ASEAN over in Asia. <clears throat> it's largely uh, driven by economics. Uh, it usually begins that way, sort of trading relationships. And uh, in this uh, country, uh, we would uh, join with Canada and Mexico and NAFTA, and then you would have your North American Union and so forth. And so that's why uh, what's going on in the Middle East is important, because there's no union there. They they have various uh, attempts. They have sort of a, what they call a Mediterranean Union. But you have to have everybody in. So uh, you can't just say, well, a Mediterranean Union is good enough, <clears throat> because there are nations, you know, Iran and, and others that aren't, aren't on the Mediterranean. But you, you have to get them in some sort of uh, regional uh, union. And that's what uh, Brzezinski meant uh, when he said that in 1995, at the first day of the World Forum, uh, hosted by Mikhail Gorbachev, that we won't get to a world government through one quick leap. Uh, we'll have to do it by progressive regionalization. And so their dialectical process moves forward. And that's what uh, a lot of this Arab Spring and so forth uh, is about. And so that's why, even though uh, some of your leading pundits, uh, the conservative side, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and others, said Barack Obama would not be reelected, I was saying, I believe he is, uh, would be, uh, because uh, it was very important for two reasons. He has a Muslim background, so he'd be able to relate to the Muslim or revolutionary uprisings in North Africa and the Middle East beginning in 2011. And uh, you can see within just, I think, about three months, he made uh, presidential overtures to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, from the beginning of his administration. Uh, now, you, you might say, well, yeah, but look what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. You, you have to remember uh, how the, the parallel operates. Uh, they like to control people. They want power and control. They don't care about political parties or left, right, or whatever. And so they would uh, support uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, but they don't want anybody to get too strong. 
In other words, they supported a Nasser, but they didn't want him to get too strong. They supported Saddam Hussein, but they didn't want him to get too strong. They supported Gaddafi, but they didn't want him to get too strong. So they support various people who they put into power and use and all, but they don't like any nationalist leader who gets too strong. So what was happening in Egypt was the Muslim Brotherhood was starting at a little bit too quick a pace to implement Sharia law and sort of dampen down any opposition. So it was, it was getting, a little, getting a little uppity, as they, the colloquialism. So they had to you know, be put in their place, and so the military stepped in and so forth. But you, you'll notice uh, that uh, right now there's sort of an amelioration there. Things have settled down a little, and the, the focus has uh, shifted to Syria. And in the near future, I'll probably write a column about uh, how Syria plays into all this. It's, it's not simply, uh, the, the power elite doesn't just simply say, well, Assad's a bad guy, let's have a revolution, and that's it. Uh, these things take long, long, long-range planning. And so I'll probably get into that uh, in another one of my News Reviews articles uh, coming up. But the point is, uh, you, you may say, well, why, why the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, it happened to be a particularly uh, organized effort uh, that would span various countries. So if you're going to have a regionalization in the Middle East, you would far uh, much rather uh, not have to negotiate with individual leaders in Tunisia and Algeria and uh, Syria and Egypt and Bahrain and Kuwait. So it, what you would like to do is have one entity, like the Brotherhood, and then you could just negotiate with them. And then they would, uh, you know, be uh, putting the word out to all of the countries uh, in, in which they had risen to power or considerable strength that, you know, this is the agreement. This is, this is what we'll do for this Middle Eastern region. And so uh, that'll be coming, uh, not, not too distant future, because they, they have a timetable. And the, the Brotherhood was the leading organization. Uh, that uh, could, you know, structure these re revolutions that they had, the Arab Spring, still still ongoing. And uh, they would be uh, in a unique uh, uh, cross-countries position to facilitate the regionalization that the, uh, that the, nation, that the uh, uh, nations involved would have to uh, arrange in order to have this uh, regional government. The beginning with trade, of course. You've got to have the carrot and the stick and that sort of thing. And so then after they do that, then they can link it up with the European Union and the African Union and so forth and so on. So uh, the second point, though, uh, that uh, President Obama was important to have uh, reelected was that, that he would be moving us increasingly towards socialism. And that uh, is uh, going to be necessary for an eventual, uh, quote, uh, comfortable merger. Uh, with other socialist uh, regions such as Europe and Latin America. Now, the reason I said comfortable merger is I had earlier in the chapter talked about uh, Rowan Gaither, head of the Ford Foundation, saying that they had been under directives from the White House ever since the days of the OSS, which means under Roosevelt, to so alter life in America as to have a comfortable merger with the Soviet Union. So if you're going to have all of these uh, nations comfortably merging, into uh, socialist uh, to socialist nations to form a region such as Europe or Latin America. Let me just comment. Uh, basically, we have an interview with Norman Dodd. Uh, it's a classic interview. You can find that in our DVD, The Desperate Deception. And Norman Dodd was the director of research for the Reese Committee, only congressional committee ever allowed to investigate the great tax exam foundations. And in that, he actually tells, and you'll actually hear him telling about his interview with Rowan Gaither, the president of the Ford Foundation, who says, you know, of course, we are operating under presidential directive to so alter life in America that one day we can be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. And Norman Dodd says, well, would you tell the American people that? And Rowan Gaither says, of course not. Of course not, of course, but you really need to get that DVD. It is classic. It's an important part of history, and you can actually see it with your own eyes. It's called The Desperate Deception. It's available from Radio Liberty by calling 1-800-544-8927. My interview with Norman Dodd. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and so uh, it was important for Barack Obama to be reelected uh, for the various reasons, moving us towards socialism. And 
the the way I uh, see it is that uh, things uh, economically will not be too bad this year or next year, but after the 2014 election, it'll start to go downhill. And by 2016, uh, people will be pretty well through uh, with uh, Barack Obama, and so there'll be time for this alternation of power that I've mentioned before. That, of course, would be a Republican, and uh, it could be uh, Jeb Bush. Time for another Bush uh, in 2016, and he would, in a couple of years, he would try vigorously, you know, I'm trying to save the currency and all that, but he will say Barack Obama and the situation got uh, just too bad so that we'll have to accept uh, the Phoenix as the new world currency, which is planned for 2018. And I put a picture of that uh, at the in, inside the book, uh, my book, The Parallels to Their History and Future, from the cover of The Economist magazine, which is connected with British intelligence. That issue is January 9th of 1988. And I put a, a rendition of it on the front cover of the book itself. And not the exact same as the, the Economist version, but it, and it will say on the cover, World Phoenix 2018. That's the uh, cover design that's uh, unique. And so uh, what they'll do is uh, have this world currency. Now, that doesn't mean the dollar would no longer exist. The dollar will still be around in the, the yen and the lira and the pound and the franc and all that. But the currencies will be so devalued that they'll only be used for internal purposes. Any, any of your international transactions will be in this new world currency that eventually, down, down the road, of course, uh, the dollar and all of these currencies will be uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, but not immediately. It will, they'll, they'll still be around in 2018. It's just that the new world currency will be introduced as a, a means of having stability, economic stability on a worldwide basis for international transactions. And so uh, what would happen then is if Jeb Bush, uh, after four years, is reelected, because the, the pattern is usually to have a double term. You have Reagan with a double term. Now, the reason George H.W. Bush did not have a double term was because they needed uh, a number of Democratic votes in order to pass uh, NAFTA and GATT. So that's why. But the, George H.W. Bush is a good soldier, and he was he knew that his son, George W., would be elected and have a couple of terms beginning in 2001. So he has a couple of terms, and Barack Obama has a couple of terms. And so if Jeb Bush is reelected, uh, that would mean uh, that the, the next election uh, would be in 2024, 20, uh, and the uh, new president would take office in 2025, and that is the year in which uh, Luciferian occultist Alice Bailey proclaimed that the, quote, World Federation of Nations, quote, would be, quote, taking rapid shape according to, quote, the plan, end quote. And so that, uh, that is the first half of this particular chapter I have in my book about the Paralyte Historical Outline. And there is a plan, ladies and gentlemen. You read the Theosophist's statements. That, in fact, I interviewed a Theosophist last night. You can hear him on my website. And basically, he told me you know, quite openly that Theosophists, the Rosicrucians, and the, uh, the Masons, the Freemasons, they all work together for the common goal. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and just uh, as an aside, picking up on what you just said about your guest last night, the common goal, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to diverge, uh, since you brought that up, from uh, going through my book, because it, it's sort of important for the, the, your listeners to understand how these things happen. Uh, uh, that, as I said, this particular chapter in my book is a historical outline, outline meaning brief, you know, like a, like a summary. So what what you need to understand is, uh, let's, let's pick up a point like uh, the Freemasons and uh, Albert Pike and his book Morals and Dogma in 1871. What you had at that time, it, it, it's sort of hard for us to imagine this because we're living today, but at that time, you had uh, the the British Empire. It had not reached its peak, its zenith, but it was it, it, almost there. It was almost there, and uh, it was Queen Victoria and so forth. And so, what you had was a a racial superiority attitude. Now, for Pike, uh, Pike was uh, a Confederate general. And when the, the Civil War ended, it wasn't as though everybody, especially the elite like Pike, the planter class, 
uh, said, okay, now we're all equal and everything's hunky-dory and let's move ahead. Uh, they still had that, that attitude. Now, the attitude had been furthered. You have to remember, Pike wrote this book in 1871, and uh, Darwin uh, wrote a couple of books. And uh, one of them was also written in 1871. He had Origin of the Species before, but then he had another book in 1871. And uh, what, what he was doing was describing uh, a process of evolution. And he didn't just talk about, you know, little birds and amoeba and stuff. He, the, the subtitle of his, his, one of his books was and The Most Favored Races. Favored Races. So he included people. And he actually talked about the Aborigines and Australia being like apes and so forth and so on. So what you had was somebody like Pike, and the Civil War had ended, but he still had a sort of, uh, you know, elitist uh, superiority complex. Uh, the, the planter class had slaves for, for hundreds of years. You know, it wasn't just that, you know, the, the last 50 years or so. Uh, the first slaves were brought over, you know, centuries ago uh, to this country. So there was a whole, you know, decade after decade and century after century of an attitude of, you know, we are the superior ones and uh, they are inferior. Now, to, to some extent, uh, you had your Simon Legrees who were vicious and all that sort of stuff. But you have to remember that George Washington and, you know, these people, founders of the country, they had slaves too. Now, they didn't get out, you know, with whips, bull whips that beat the slaves. It was actually a, a, a sort of a, a, a filial relationship. You would have them paying a good deal of attention. You might have a sick house slave, and you might have Martha Washington, you know, tending to the slave. Or, or George Washington would be very sympathetic. It was like it was sort of like a family almost. But even though it was like that, you still had this notion of superiority. And so it was completely natural in the 1800s for somebody like Pike, uh, who had revised the, the Scottish Rite of Freemasons, uh, to be very, very sympathetic with what was going on in England. And John Ruskin and his uh, statement about that we are the best northern blood and Cecil Rhodes, and he picked up on we are the best hold, northern hold that blood. Thought, hold that thought. We'll be right back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and the, the Dennis was simply sort of describing the attitude that existed in America before the Civil War. And basically, that was, of course, that uh, there was a superior race, and that was the white, the English race, the, the white man, and he was superior to the black man. And basically, of course, that there was compassion many times, and almost a familiar relationship. Certainly, if one of Washington's slaves was ill, why Martha Washington might very well be there helping to care for the slaves. But it was a very paternalistic attitude. In other words, we have a superior race, the white man. We have the black race, inferior. And this certainly permeates even, certainly after the Civil War. Albert Pike, certainly who wrote the book, Morals and Dogma, the father of modern-day masonry, writing in his book, certainly in, in, in his writings, uh, the superior attitude they have. But, of course, what people have missed is the strong occultic influence on in, in Freemasonry, the strong occultic influence behind everything going on in America at that time, and that same occultic influence is working at the highest levels of our government today. This is not rational. It is made up of people who have an entirely different worldview because they worship a different spiritual entity. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh yeah, and uh, in, in the case of the United States, of course, the, the relationship of uh, African slaves, uh, and even after they were freed, you know, in the 13th Amendment and to the Constitution, so forth and so on, of course, everybody didn't just say, oh, okay, well, everything's changed now. That, that notion of racial superiority continued. And uh, therefore, there was an affinity uh, between people like Pike and uh, people like John Ruskin, and Cecil Rhodes in the late 1800s uh, over in Europe. And it wasn't just, you know, their attitude toward blacks. It was everybody. I mean, when when uh, Ruskin said, we're the best northern blood, and, uh, you know, Cecil Rhodes followed up with that, as they believed they were, you know, superior to everybody, uh, to, the, you know, the uh, Indians in America, the, the Asians, you know, the Japanese. <laughs> And they, of course, now the Japanese had a different view. Uh, they, they, and the Chinese too. 
But they referred to us as barbarians, and they were cultured. But our attitude, the Anglo-Saxon race, was, well, we're the best northern blood. And it was just sort of a matter of fact. You know, that, that's the way it was. And so Pike uh, fit in with that. And you'll start to see uh, Pike and others. What they did was when he wrote things like Morals and Dogma, he he followed it up the next year in 1872 with Indo-Aryan deities and their worship. Note that word Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N. And Hitler would pick up on that. Say the Aryan race is the superior race. And then a couple of years later, he did Irano, I-R-A-N-O, Irano-Aryan deities and their worship. And so you have these deities, and they, they have uh, this connection with this superior race, this, this Aryanism. And then, you know, it, later on, you would find that when, when Hitler's trying to rouse the, the German people and refer back to the blood and the land and you know, the Teutonic race, and you go on back, and eventually, you know, thousands of years ago, the Aryans, the only civilization supposedly that survived the uh, destructive Atlantis. There were seven civilizations, and one survived, and it wound up in Shambhala, according to what uh, Solon was told by the uh, priests of the Temple of Isis in uh, Saif, S-A-I-S, Egypt. It, that, that town no longer exists, but the area is still there. Uh, and so uh, this was their attitude. And so on the, the gravestone of uh, of uh, John Ruskin is a swastika. I put that, a picture of that in my book, The Globalist. And so you have this racial superiority attitude. And so uh, what you would have is somebody like Pike uh, continuing that. You know, we we are the superior ones. And so what he would do is he would uh, join up, uh, as Dr. Stan said, there's this occultic attitude, this, this sort of Aryan race, uh, the secret knowledge of the East. And they would, they would, you know, Hitler and all of these people would go over there. And they would go over to uh, to uh, India. And uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget his name. Uh, Blavatsky's uh, right-hand man. I can see his face now. He, he went over there for, to India for 25 years. Because, see, that's where Shambhala is. That's where the secret knowledge is. That's where you can get the, the power from uh, the deities, right? The deities. Well, you know, who's the biggest... It's the biggest deity they like. Well, for Pike, it's, it's Lucifer, and for Blavatsky, it's Lucifer, and that's why they would you, they could be seen socially in Washington D.C. Pike and Blavatsky walking arm in arm to some social function. Uh, they got along, you know, very very well. And uh, Lucifer, of course, was the, the light, the solar angel who was bringing, you know, the, the knowledge. And that's why Pike instituted the Scottish Rite, where they're seeking more light. You go up for the first degree, second degree, we want more light, more light. And that's what Lucifer means, well, light me, bearer. Let me just point out that our current president, Barack Obama, is a, was a follower of Saul Alinsky. If you haven't read Saul's book, you need to read it. It's called Rules for a, Re- a Rebel or Revolt. Radical. Ra- Rules for Radicals. And the book is dedicated. To Lucifer. I mean, the president is a follower of a man whose book is dedicated to Lucifer. I've got a copy. You can get it as well. Dennis, you go right ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't want to belabor it too, too long, but this, the point is, this is, uh, as Dr. Stan was mentioning, the theosophical guest he had last night talking about the common purposes. Now, this is how you can have the, the Freemasons under Pike's uh, tutelage and his uh, revision of the Scottish Rite and the Theosophists, uh, both uh, sort of being into this uh, this Luciferian Arianism, and you'll find articles uh, they they called it the New Age up until recently. Uh, and, and I put a quote in one of my books from 1951, the New Age, it's the Masonic magazine, where it's talking about we America is the sixth Aryan uh, civilization. And it's that, that sort of superiority. And that's why uh, they even today you basically have a sort of division for the most part of lodges. You have uh, African-Americans joining the Prince Hall Lodge. And to a large extent, uh, especially in the South, you have uh, almost these all-white uh, Masonic lodges. So you still have that sort of separation, which goes back, you know, that, that whole attitude of Arianism and the, the superior race and so on, and which was fed uh, and by the, the elite uh, in general uh, in the late 1800s because you'd have Dar- Darwin, and they would. this was a way they could justify, uh, like, John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller once said competition is a sin. 
and he, he you know, believed that he was uh, an elite. And it was uh, the the attitude goes back to many centuries. It's called noblesse oblige. The nobility is obligated. You know, take care of the peasants and and so forth. We're superior. We have the best cult. We're more cultured. We're the best educated. We're the best bred. You know, they look at like evolution. For example, you have an evolving uh, group of animals. You know, the the stronger and better horse, the cow, and all this sort of stuff. So you'll find a lot of times the elite are into breeding. You know, we want to breed a, a better, you know, whatever it is they're breeding. And so they look at people the same way. And this so it was very natural that Hitler would come along and say, well, we're going to create this superior race. You know, and we have to get rid of all these, these other people, the handicapped and so forth and so on. And so you you have that uh, that that attitude. And so uh, who is you know who who is the natural superior deity uh, that they would look to? It would be for the the Osophus and uh, for Pike and these people. It would be Luke. Hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and uh, Dr. Cuddy is simply pointing out the fact that uh, some of these elitists, uh, Albert Pike, the, the Theosophists, the Masons, the uh, people living there in the uh, latter part of the uh, 19th century, we're talking about uh, in the 1870s, uh, 1890s, in that area where Madame Blavatsky was writing, the, the woman who really created the Theosophy, and she was uh, certainly very, very close to Albert Pike. They would walk hand in hand hand or arm in arm uh, through the streets there, uh, basically all coming from the same goal, an elite group who's going to remake the world. And of course they look to their deity who is Lucifer. This is not imaginary. There's tremendous, uh, certainly uh, among these elitists, tremendous uh, certainly hatred of the of, of black people, and they look down, I should say, on the black people today. And basically, of course, why do you think there's so many black people in prison today? It is because, of course, that they they know very well. Uh, I, this is a little off subject, but uh, the, they uh, the largest clinical study ever done in the world was done on 450. Thousand children, 450,000 children, they took finger sticks and tested the blood for lead. And what was it? Well, they wanted to see the children, what happened to the lead and the, and the blood of the children who drank regular water, fluoridated water, and water fluoridated with hydrofluoric salicylic acid. And of course, the only one that really had a marked increase in the level of the lead was certainly in the hydrofluoric salicylic acid, which is used in 90% of water fluoridation. The level of lead in the brown doubles in whites, goes four, four times in uh, Hispanics, and six times in blacks. And of course, it produces lead encephalopathy, and that excuses criminal activity, definite correlation between criminal activity and the fact we're poisoning the black population and nobody is ever going to mention this is the work of Dr. Roger Masters Dr. Roger Masters we have all the scientific studies on it you can get this in our our talk on the hidden agenda the other uh, story of water fluoridation but you're never going to hear this and they know exactly what they're doing to black people and basically of course what they've done is intentionally destroy their minds and increase the criminal activity where about 40 percent of the people in popular in prisons today are black it's because we're poisoning them the elites are doing it they know exactly what they're doing because the the elites are predominantly white and they look down upon the black go right ahead dennis uh <clears throat> Yeah, and um, so what you what you have is uh, you might say, well, uh, if if you're list if you're a listener and you're saying, well, I'm a free base and I don't do it, you have to remember that uh, they said Pike said they deliberately mislead uh, those of the lower degrees, the blue degrees, the first three degrees. Uh, but uh, and, and this is not just something for the 1800s. About 20 years ago, I think C. Fred Kleinick, who was the sovereign grand commander then, back the uh, 1990s said, oh yeah, Albert Pike's message and philosophy is as good now as it, as it ever was. So Pike is still very well respected. They have a statue of him in Washington. He's in tomb there in the, uh, the uh, temple in Washington, D.C. And if you, if you look carefully at the outside of the temple, you'll see these serpents and embedded swastikas on the thing. And inside, on this sort of blue background wall of these, you know, snakes and whatever. And all of this stuff has a meaning. And you say, well, what? I mean, Lucifer, that's Satan. Well, they, they don't look, they don't, they don't see Lucifer as Satan. Uh, what they, they look at Lucifer almost as something separate. Uh, a Christian who looks at the Bible, of course, knows as, the same thing, but their 
view is that uh, it, it's almost like the Eastern Yin Yang. You know, there's a, a force and there's a dark side and the light side and so forth. And so they look at the, the the Godhead as not a singular entity, but you have Adonai in the Bible, and he's the judgmental God. He's the one that says, thou shalt not do this, that, and the other. But Lucifer, he's the one who brings light, you know. Try this, try that, seek more knowledge, uh, more light, more light, so forth. He's the one who is expanding your consciousness. So, so he's, he's the good force, you know, if you want to call it the force. So he's the good force. And in fact, if you look at Star Wars, if you read some of the background of uh, Lucas and all, he, you'll you'll actually see it's not you know not obvious, but occasionally he mentions how uh, he has some little occultic uh, aspect to this force thing. It's not just like he was sitting around making up this thing. He he has done some research in, in this sort of view, this philosophy, and, and it's a it's a a philosophy which is still known and understood not by the blue degrees but by the leadership. And that's why if you go to any Masonic library, not only will you find the books of Albert Pike there, very well respected, but you'll also find the books of the Manly P. Hall. And in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, he actually says that they have the seething energies. See, light is an energy of force. The seething energies of Lucifer are in the Mason's hands. And so this is that, that sort of occult power and knowledge. And you say, well, what, you know, where, where's that going to get you? Well, they view it as a Gnostic principle. They, they might just not describe it like that all the time, but it really is Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, Gnosticism. And Gnosticism has been uh, for centuries a big threat to Christianity. It popped up mm, about 100 years after Christ's uh, crucifixion, and ever since then the, the little Gnostic head raises itself, and that, that view is that we're all little sparks from God. We're a little spark, and he sends us forth in his creation, and we do our thing down here, and then we will return back to the, the Godhead, these, our, our little spirits, these little lights, you know, the light, point of light. Little lights will, and it's usually in a spiral. That's why the New Age likes these spirals. We will spiral on up to God and back to the Godhead, the oneness, you know, the oneness. And so that's the way they look at all this stuff. And so they, they believe they're the chosen and the elite, and they have the special job of carrying this forth. And that's why somebody like Barbara Marks Hubbard, in her book of co-creation that she originally wrote, I think it was about 1980, said, look, uh, we are the riders of the pale horse. Uh, we will get rid of the defective seeds, as she called them. You know, that's us, the ones who don't go, go along with this uh, this plan, the uh, plan that these ascended masters are uh, bestowing upon us, of course, through key people like uh, Blavatsky and Annie Besant and Alice Bailey and so forth. They're, you know, they're getting ch these channels, the channels from Joao Cool and uh, the rest of the, you know, Kudhumi and the rest of those, uh, I call them descended masters. Uh, but uh, they, they do exist. I mean, they're, they're demons. They're evil spirits. They're not ascended anywhere. They're just plain evil spirits, and they're, you know, agents of Lucifer is, is what they are. And so uh, that's, that's just uh, a long aside, I guess. But back to the uh, the chapter of the book, the historical outline of these people. So the first part I, uh, of the chapter, I go into the politics and the economics and the process. Uh, however, uh, if you're going to do that, if, if you're going to actually recreate the world, uh, they apparently can't achieve uh, their ultimate success unless they can shift the values of the people away from the, the values of the Holy Bible toward those of what we would call today uh, secular humanists. And so the, the second half of this chapter in my book, I deal with how they shifted the values, because you've got to have both. And that's why uh, whenever the Rockefellers are up to something, like the mid-century challenge to American foreign policy, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund came out with in 1959, uh, they'll talk about this new world order. They'll mention the term new world order and, and say part of it is spiritual, that they have to fashion. They have to fashion our spiritual future. So they, you know, they look at not just politics and economics, but they understand the power of values and people's values. So 
in the, in the second half of the chapter, I begin, you could go way back, but I begin with Adam Weisop, the founder of the Illuminati, on uh, May 1st of 1776. And what they wanted to do was not just overthrow uh, the monarch or monarchical authority, kings and queens, but they wanted to also uh, overthrow religious authority, promoting the concept of uh, what, what he said, do what thou wilt. He wasn't the first one to say it. Uh, yeah, I think he had Rabelais several centuries before. But it's basically this Machiavellian concept, do what thou wilt. You know, do it, do your own thing, as they would say uh, in the 1960s. So uh, what happened was, once they were discovered, they didn't just end, they dispersed in the 1780s. And uh, the Illuminati in France, what they did was infiltrate the Masonic Lodges. Now, the reason they did that was Masonic Lodges were, you know, secret oaths and all that. And if you're the Illuminati and you're going to be up to some shenanigans overthrowing people, you want secrecy. So that was a natural place for them to go. So they infiltrated the Masonic Lodges and helped to foment to that country the French Revolution, which began in uh, 1789. And it not only uh, overthrew the Bourbons, uh, that's the, the ruling family of France, a long time, 1589 to 1793, they overthrew them, but also they sought to destroy the religious authority of, at that time, at that place, the Catholic Church. That was the leading a religious authority, and they, they actually symbolically placed the prostitute on the altar at the Notre Dame Cathedral to show, you know, that's what they were doing. And uh, during that period, of uh, the revolution against religious values, you would have people well known today like the Marquis de Sade, uh, from which uh, the term, from whom the term status comes. He was a nasty fellow, you know, doing all sorts of evil stuff. And uh, he, uh, uh, Marquis de Sade, advocated abortion as a necessary means of uh, population control. He did that in his book called La, La Philosophie dans le Boudoir, that means the philosophy in the bedroom in 1795, and Weisop you know, did the same thing. He would advocate abortion, and, and so it was, because do what thou wilt. You know, it didn't matter if you're killing a baby. It didn't matter. You know, do whatever you want. And then, so then we go into the early 1800s, and the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, who had been part of the French Revolution, the initial phase, of course it got bloodier and bloodier as it went along, and so people like Citizen Genet was, were even afraid to go back home because they might be guillotined. So the Marquis de Lafayette uh, comes over here again, and he brings with him the Madame Francoise de Rousmont, uh to the United States, and uh, she uh, she wanted a more you know colloquial name that would fit in with Americans, so she called herself Fanny <laughs> Fanny Wright. And, and uh, in 1828, uh, she joined up with Robert Owen uh, in his uh, first commune in America, which was established in New Harmony, Indiana, in uh, 1825. Uh, so, uh, the Owen said, uh, for example, I am, this, this would give you an idea of their attitude. This, this is a philosophical revolution. So in 1825, Owen said, quote, I am come to this country, the USA, to introduce an entire new order of society, end quote. And Fanny Wright, uh, was an apostle of his, uh, you know, free marital union and birth control and all that stuff. Do what thou wilt. And so the next year, after they established uh, in 1828, 1828 uh, the uh, first comedy there in New Harmony, uh, they had bigger plans. You know, Fanny and the rest of them weren't just going to you know, live there in the sticks of Indiana forever. So the next year, in 1829, uh, Fanny Wright and uh, Owen, Robert Owen's son, Robert Dale Owen, uh, joined with another person uh, named Orestes Brownson to form the Working Men's Party. Working Men's Party. And to get it, you know, Workers of the World Unite, the first commune 20 years before Karl Marx, Working Men's Party, uh, when, uh, later, a few, about 10, 15 years later, Orestes Brownson sort of saw, you know, what the, the error of his ways, and he converted to Christianity, and he wrote about 20 volumes. And I think in volume 19, he uh, later reveals what they were up to, and he says, quote, the great object of their plot, their plot, their great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert convert churches into halls of science. The plan was to establish a system of state, we said national, schools, from which all religion was to be excluded. We were to have godless schools for all the children of the country. The plan has been successfully pursued, in quote. So here he is uh, talking, writing in the 1840s about how successful they were. The plan was going forward. Uh, Robert Owen, Robert uh, Robert Dale Owen. 
And uh, he he would later, you know, be very, very influential in creating the Smithsonian, which is, of course, the, a sort of temple to science. And that's what they were going to do. They weren't just going to come out and say, you know, down with Christianity. They were going to replace it. They were going to replace it with something else that people could worship. And people started worshiping, you know, worshiping science. Oh, science does this. Science says we've evolved. You cannot question science. You're an old, fuddy-duddy, religious ignoramus. You know, science rules. And so that would, that would be their, their approach. And uh, apparently, sensing what was occurring at the time, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, was from France, and he was in this country doing a lot of traveling. And after he looked around a while, in 1840, he wrote this book called Democracy in America. And he described, he, he sensed what was going on. He saw that he, he wrote a number of very, very good things about the churches and religion in America, but he also had this eerie feeling that, you know, something was going on. And uh, so he decided to, to warn about the potential for despotism here. And he did that by saying, quote, I do not expect their, the democracies, he said, leaders to be tyrants. So I did not expect that, but rather schoolmasters. See, he saw it was going to come through the schools. And under such uh, despotism, he indicated that, quote, the will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, innervates. That's not innovate, but E-N-E-R-V-A-T-E-S. Innervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people, end quote. Now, after the Tocqueville's uh, warning appeared, Karl Marx, in his uh, Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, that's four years before his the manifesto, he professed that, this is Marx, 1844, quote, Communism begins from the outset with atheism. Communism, as fully developed naturalism, equals humanism. So there we get a, a definite connection between communism uh, as fully developed naturalism equals humanism. And then uh, four years later, of course, he came out with his manifesto in 1848. And during that same period, a uh, French revolutionist, uh, the name was uh, Comte, that means Count, Comte de Saint-Simon, secretary, his name was Auguste Comte, C-O-M-T-E, uh, was developing his uh, morally relative, uh, relativistic religion of humanity. That's what he called it. He's developing this religion of humanity, not God-based, but humanity-based. You know, man was going to decide what's right or wrong for himself. That's, you know, situation ethics. That's what the Humanist Manifesto says. And in the 1850s, uh, Comte uh, published four volumes describing this yeah, the system, he called it, the system of positive polity. Positive polity. And uh, relevant to that, on December 8th of 1861, uh, Lord Acton wrote to Richard Simpson, uh, characterizing a cunning and treacherous group of people, saying, quote, they saw no divine part of Christianity, but divinified humanity or humanized religion. You know, like the New Ages would say, man is God. You know, you're the God within. We're all God. And uh, from Comte's system, of course, would come the morally relativistic, positivist uh, philosophy, which was uh, adopted by many people in the legal profession, ultimately uh, resulting in uh, some federal judges saying the Constitution means whatever they say it means, regardless of the founder's original intent. And of course, these judges, these Supreme Court judges, basically, uh, were tied into this whole world occult movement. The Masons controlled the United States Supreme Court in majorities of 5 to 4 to 6 to 3. From 1941 to 1971, it was during that time, they took God and prayer out of our schools. They knew exactly what they were doing, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't any of our religious leaders tell us that? Why? Because they've infiltrated certainly our churches, our seminaries, or they've infiltrated every aspect of Christianity, changed both the music and the message. We're in real trouble. And if we want to reclaim America, we must claim, reclaim the Christian faith. Well, past, well, uh, Dennis, we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. We got way off track, but I think it's a very important uh, subject. I think it was a very important program. And we're going to certainly make this the tape of the month. And to certainly, along with our tape with the Theosophist, I think he, he was a brilliant fellow. He just has a, an entirely different worldview. Dennis, you've got about a minute, two minutes to wrap up the program for us. Uh, okay. Well, uh, like I said, uh, in 1859 and 71, uh, Darwin wrote his works on evolution. 
And uh, that gave rise to social Darwinism. You know, when it applied to man, not just to bugs and, you know, critters. Uh, and the alteration of values uh, that went with it. Uh, because, uh, after all, if man is simply an evolved animal with some uh, superior to others, then uh, eugenics, you know, eugenics would be justified. Uh, and picking up on that concept, uh, I mentioned Professor John Ruskin in Oxford believed they were the best source of blood. And that was picked up by his disciple Cecil Rhodes, uh, who in 1891 formed the Secret Society of the Elect, uh, quote, to take the government of the whole world, as uh, Rhodes said. And uh, those uh, with uh, the best northern blood, of course, would be like the philosopher king of uh, Plato's Republic and the French Revolution. And they uh, considered themselves born to rule the masses. Uh, among the elite, of course, were the Rockefellers. And uh, I think uh, Congressman Dannemeyer overheard uh, David Rockefeller once uh, saying uh, some men are born to rule. Uh, but most men are born to be ruled. And so this is, you know, the hereditary elite. They pass this view down a generation after generation. And uh, that's where we are today. And uh, next time we'll pick up with the Rockefellers uh, introducing Margaret Sanger in the 1900s uh, to those who would uh, support her eugenic causes. And we'll go from there. God bless. Thanks very much. We'll look forward to talking again next week at the same time. Thanks for having me. Good night. Bye. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and one reason I enjoy doing what I'm doing is because I never know what's going to happen. And I didn't anticipate we were going to get off in this discussion, but there's certainly nobody who understands the background of this, of this spiritual battle better than my good friend, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and what a privilege it is to have him as a guest on our program. If you'd like to really understand so much of what's going on today, you really should get the interview with uh, Mr. Robert Bonner last night and a copy of the program today with Dennis. Maybe one day maybe we can put them into some sort of a, a four CD set, but you ought to get those two. And then get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, and then certainly our four CD set on, on Freemasonry. You need to get this information so that you can understand the real battle going on today. Our telephone number is 1-800-544-8927. Certainly, I would suggest my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. I would suggest the, the interview last night on theosophy and the, the remarks from Dr. Dennis Cuddy today. This will give you a good place to begin to understand what's really going on, because nothing is as it appears to be. I mean, basically, you cannot understand anything going on unless you understand this is a spiritual battle, and there's a supernatural element, there's supernatural forces at work that are moving us rapidly towards the climax of history. And what we're doing is seeing a spiritual battle being fought out on a political and ideological battlefield, but it is a spiritual battle. And that's the only way you can understand why America is certainly fighting the Muslim Brotherhood and, the, and certainly the wicked Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and funding the wicked Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Syria and in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Libya. How do you understand that? Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, they're lying to you. Everything is deceit and deception. Our number is one 800 But if you haven't read Brotherhood of Darkness, you get, need to get it. Again, our number is one 800 one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. If you'd like to get that interview, certainly with Norman Dodd, going into the background of how Rowan Gaither. Uh, from the Ford Foundation, incidentally, Henry Ford was deeply involved in the occult. But Rowan Gaither, the Ford Foundation, said, told Norman Dodd, uh, the purpose of we are operating here at the Ford Foundation under a presidential directive to so modify life in America that one day we could be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. And ladies and gentlemen, we have far more socialism in America today than they ever had in either communist China or communist Russia. We live in the most utopian society in the world. The only trouble is we can't afford it. We're spending money we don't have. And this is all designed to destroy our economic system and impoverish the American people. So basically, of course, we do hope you'll want to get that DVD. It's called the Dangerous Deception. Of course, you can get my interview with, with uh, Ambassador Smith. It's called the 
a world revolution where he will tell you he was the American ambassador to Cuba in 1959 that we intentionally brought Fidel Castro to power and we knew Fidel Castro was a communist and we brought him to power anyway. And then, of course, in my interview with Anthony Sutton, Professor Anthony Sutton, the best enemies money could buy. That's an excellent DVD. We haven't talked about it in some time, but it's pivotal. We create these enemies. We fund the enemies. We funded the communists. We funded the Nazis. We're funding the terrorists today. Of course, Anthony Sutton doesn't get into that. The interview we did back in 1980, but it's fundamental as we talk about how we funded the Nazis how we funded the, the communists and the same things going on today. Our telephone number, 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage, RadioLiberty.com. And quite frankly, we do need your help. We hope many of you out there will be in a position to join the Radio Liberty family and help us as we find, uh, help, help us finance our uh, radio stations where we're heard five hours a day. Give us a call if you'd like to join the Radio Liberty family to take the vitamins and minerals, get our t- books and tapes, and then please pray for America, but pray for Radio Liberty, our provision and our protection. Mm-hmm. 